back again with another Field Talk. And today, I have a special guest who will take us on a journey of continuous learning, creative exploration, and the power of embracing new technologies. Joining me is the incredibly talented Nick Chen, a music producer, educator, and video creator who recently became the content director for video at Splice. In his new role, he will be leading video efforts across all Splice's marketing channels that showcases the amazing tools and resources that it has to offer. In this episode, Nick shares his insights on finding inspiration and motivation in the vast digital landscape, avoiding burnout while pursuing our passions and the art of faking it until you make it. But that's not all. Nick gives us a glimpse into the world of sound field recording and the incredible process of flipping sounds to create mesmerizing tracks. Discover how he manages creative decision fatigue and choice paralysis by using an extreme method. And if that's not enough to pique your interest, Nick will take us on a ride through the world of music production and breaking free from standard operating procedures. Plus, he shares his perspective on the role of AI in the creative process and how Splice's new tool that uses its vast library of samples created by talented musicians stands as a true AI powered by humans. Get ready to fall down the rabbit hole with Nick Chin in the field of video and music creation, and let's get creative. Well, hello, Nick. How are you doing today? Craig, so great to meet with you. And, you know, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to talk creative, uh, you know, ideas, ideation. So excited. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to come out and share your knowledge and all of the things that you've been doing. And I can't wait to dig in and really learn from what you have accomplished and you've experienced. So uh, with that said, I hope that you could share a little bit about your journey as a music producer and educator and how you transitioned into your role as the content director at Splice. Yeah, so, you know, as a musician, I studied music in college. I've always loved playing instruments and, you know, was going the band director route at one point. Um, And I've always been into technology. Like, that's also just been a huge thing about me, like getting, building computers and, and getting into video games. And it's like, I've always been into technology. So those kind of two passions kind of converged, I feel like, you know, after I graduated and, and uh, you know, after you got out of college, there's like, there's no roadmap, right? It's, it's pretty open. You're in a little bubble in college and everything's very guided. And it's like, here's what you can do. And mm-hmm. then you're getting to the real world. And there's, it, it gets a little more, you know, just open parameters, right? So those mm-hmm. two things started to fuse really quickly, um, you know, post-college. And then I started, you know, YouTube was the ultimate resource at that time for learning. And it's, I feel like still is. Uh, so like, you know, started picking up tutorials on a Fruity Loops, of, of course, was the first dog I kind of messed with. And then, uh, actually, I don't even know if there were YouTube tutorials when I started with Fruity Loops, but it's like got into the, the different, you know, technical softwares and those two kind of merged, um, into kind of, uh, you know, my, my current passion, I would say is like, yeah, music production and now digital creation, which creating and, and then becoming an educator, I, I was able to get to DubSpot, which landed me to Splice, which as you as mentioned. Um, but I actually didn't join Splice uh, as a, uh, you know, on the creative side. I actually joined on the CX team because it was a very early company at that time. And I was just like, I would, I want to get my foot in the door at anywhere that like kind of aligns with my passion. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's like, that's a, that's what was an important learning for me is like just to be open and like um, willing to learn and malleable. Um, and that gradually then led me on the path to doing more like, oh, you can do a, tutorials, video tutorials, which led to my current role event. Okay, very cool. Um, I want to kind of pick apart a few of those little things because some of the audience or some of the people listening may not be quite at a point in their career or uh, maybe they're they're actually undergraduates or uh, still studying themselves, you know, and, and I know you voiced that it's kind of open parameters whenever you get out into the real world. And I very much felt the same thing whenever you know, we, we finished our studies at school and then you kind of step out and you're, you can assume a role like that was the thing whenever we're studying edu- to be educators, for instance, it's almost assumed that you were going to kind of go a certain path and do that certain thing. And uh, I think both you and I didn't, didn't quite follow the, the mold that was set for us 
I, I know you certainly didn't. I'm still an educator uh, in some parts of my life very much. And I know you are too. But uh, yeah, can, uh, how, how do you think, uh, what's the best ways to kind of get your foot in the door? I think what you did or what I saw, I think you've done is put yourself in an environment that's kind of challenging and you've got a lot of things around you. Like what inspired you really to move off to New York, for instance? Well, to move off to New York is a little bit of a love story, I would say. It's like, I actually was not planning to move to New York. I started dating my current wife uh, at the end of college, last semester while student teaching. And then she was like a dancer and she was, was like, I'm going to New York. I was like, well, guess I'm going to New York. So that mm. was like, maybe definitely, I feel like a factor like, yeah, that, you know, you know, I think a lot of life comes down to being in the right place at the right time. And uh, that just kind of worked itself out. But as far as like my willingness to move to New York, I feel like I've always loved traveling. Like, uh, you know, you and I, we studied South Indian music together in college. And it's like, you know, I love traveling to these different parts of the world and getting in out of, outside of my comfort zone. I think being outside of your comfort zone is great because you, first off, it lets you appreciate when you're comfortable, right? There, in life, mm-hmm. you need to have this like dichotomy of good and bad. And it's like, if everything's neutral. It's, it's just, it's, I don't, I don't, thrive in that kind of situation. So I do kind of like um, that kind of dynamism. Um, so it's like getting outside of your comfort zone um, was like that. And that's the same thing. Like, I mean, I didn't necessarily have all, like I never did. Actually, I did work at the Apple store. So that's another thing. I worked at the Apple store and shout out to anyone that has worked Apple retail. I feel like there's a lot of you that might be listening to this. Uh, I have, have at one point maybe. Um, but that definitely helped me like with the like confidence of, oh, I could do technical support, tech CX support for this, this software company. But I, I, you know, I technically have never worked at a tech company or software. And it was a little bit of slightly about a stretch, but you know, they were looking for someone with education experience. So that kind of lined up. But I think one of the most important things that's, that's great for us is, as educators, it's like, I make a joke. It's like, what's the most important skill to learn is to learn. It's like learning to learn is like one of the best things. And I, I feel like I've even listened to a podcast where a CEO uh, was talking about like one of the best things they look for any kind of employee is the willingness to learn because then it's like the employees to grow. So I think if you can just like really embody that mindset, um, it will go, it'll pay dividends. Like if you can just do it. Um, so that's, that's, I think, yeah, that little piece of advice. Well, that's definitely excellent advice. Uh, always be willing to learn and then um, trying to understand how to learn is another skill in and of itself. Uh, I'm still working on that. Uh, <laughs> I take classes from time to time to try to learn new skills and uh, definitely watch a lot of YouTube uh, tutorials. And um, that kind of leads me into the next next section here. In terms of the projects that you've uh, had your hand in, uh, you being a content creator and educator who's made YouTube tutorials, for instance. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process for you know how you're generating ideas? Are those like handed down to you, or are you just making those up by yourself? Yeah, a lot of the uh, ideas will come from just like being involved in the community. Like I'm always watching you know YouTube videos in the music production community daily at least try to, and, you know, just being in date in, in kind of touch with the titling, uh, because title and thumbnail in the YouTube world are like literally like half, you know, half the battle, like CTR rate is, is very important. So then you just got to make an engaging video. And so CTR, just in case no one knows that, or that it's click through rate, correct? Yes. Yeah. So click-through rate is very important when it comes to the success, life or death of a uh, you know, YouTube long-form video. And the title and thumbnail are a big part of that equation. And um, then your watch time is going to be like the engagement. But going back to kind of the original question, like for ideating, it's like there's also cool, like uh, I'd shout out uh, vidIQ is a tool that I've, I've started recently using. It has like AI generator just for ideas. And like, of course, you go to ChatGPT, give me 10 video title ideas for sound design, and it'll give you something to work off of. So it's like using those tools. But ultimately, I do get to decide the titling and the angle of the video uh, myself, uh, which is awesome. The thing that's kind of like when you work in this corporate, more corporate world, right? You also have to incorporate a, uh, a product generally, and it'll be like, you know, a plugin or a pack or a feature on Splice. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's where it's like, how does this video title idea maybe incorporate a cool new 
piano plugin that's coming out, you know, and well, it could be maybe a chord progression type video. Then it goes like that kind of uh, ideating. So, you know, there's a lot of freedom there with that kind of restrictive parameter. But that is one of the things, restrictive parameters are very important for creation because like now that we have tools for everything, it's like sometimes I'll literally just stare at, sit at the computer and just maybe 10 to no, five minutes and just be like, what am I going to do? Like, which software am I going to go into first? So restrictive parameters can be very helpful. I'll just say that um, for creating. And I do think that's going to be even more important as we're empowered so much, like, like godlike. I don't want to say that, but it's like, that's sacrilegious. <laughs> so that's like going to be interesting. And I think like the creation ideation process is going to be evolved with the, the tool sets as they come on. Yeah, absolutely having some kind of parameters or restrictions are uh, crucial. You know, I've, I've found this time and time again, whenever I'm creating stuff myself or with somebody else, I used to uh, do this kind of fun project with, which actually a guy I used to be in a band with back in uh, Austin, he kind of gave me the idea. Uh, but we'll, we would get together as, say, like uh, six or seven or 10 sometimes composers, and we'd try to produce some tracks on our own. Sometimes we'd team up at, in pairs or groups, and then we'd spend a whole hour or a, a whole day, excuse me, or maybe a weekend and use the time kind of restriction in that way, and then try to make as much content as we could within that block. And the amount of choices that you have is sometimes paralyzing. But I found the, the most inspired and, and most fun I had was when you know, we would just kind of spitball like the craziest ideas like, all right, we're just going to record random sounds around us. And then we're going to put it into the DAW and we're going to arrange it into like this uh, piece of work very quickly without thinking about it too much. And you get like a really interesting uh, rough idea of something whenever you do that really quickly without going through the checklist of, do I have a kick drum sound? Do I have a melody? <laughs> you know, like it just happens through whatever happens sometimes and it's great and sometimes it's not though. <laughs> I love that and I think like first off I love doing the sound field recording myself just like I love flipping sounds and like one of those restrictives like using only one sample to make an entire track is one of the most rewarding things because you don't think about when you add a new track what track am I going to do? You just drag the sample down and you're like now I need a bass so how am I going to turn this into a bass? And then it slowly evolves into the bass sound that you can make with it and you, you make it work. And I found that like a really cathartic way to kind of do uh, avoid that creative decision fatigue comes or mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, choice, uh, like paralysis by choice and decision fatigue. Like those are kind of two of the same mm -hmm. like world. And it's like, that is a serious thing to avoid. One thing I will say with the checklist though, is like, you just reminded me of a thing I did in DubSpot with my students. Um, but it's really fun where you do a checklist, like say there's 10 producers, every producer gets to make a random rule. So there's 10 rules and then everyone has to abide by those 10 rules. And it could be mm. like, we would be like, it has to go from 100 BPM to 180 BPM in the middle of the track. Or it could be like, you have to no snares, no snare drums, but it still has to hit slap. Or it could be like no kicks and it still has to slap. Or it could be no drums at all. Like, so there's a lot of fun rules you could kind of come up with. And as long as everyone's thinking creatively, it's almost like an always a dynamic game where it's like, you know, nine other people are going to pick some crazy ass rules that you might not pick. Then you put them all in and everyone has to try to do that. And then we always gave like a week or whatever in class. We just do the whole like two, an hour crunch time. And it would be really fun to see everyone share and be like, oh, yeah, there's no kicks. Oh, yeah, there's no like that. So I think <laughs> doing a checklist in that approach can be helpful rather than like the checklist we're used to where it's like, yeah, now we need a verse. Now we need like. I would say standard operating procedures, SOP, is like a very corporate yeah. term now. I'm like so corporate. Uh, that is like anti-SOP or whatever, the anti-checklist. <laughs> right. You can't do this. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't use any standard operating procedures, for instance. <laughs> I did one where it was like, you must record this in a body of water, which is kind of dangerous. I mean... Uh, inside a body. I mean, I can imagine like trying to make a sound, but... I, Oh man, I was gonna the the hack in my round is like putting your Zoom recorder and standing in a bathtub and just being like, you know, that's you're in a body of water and you're recording. You're inside the body of water, okay, but not the microphone itself. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's it's great to do use those um, those parameters. Like uh, another way I voice that is just like creating a box to kind of play in, you know, and and that's another way I I kind of get people to. Uh, avoid that fatigue that you were talking about and making all those decisions. 
Um, I was hoping that maybe, you know, since you have so uh, much experience creating content and uh, YouTube videos and, and educating, I was hoping you could share any strategies or tools or any techniques that you found particularly effective when doing these projects. I, I don't really know how long it takes you to, to go from idea to finished product, but if you could talk in some amount of detail to let people know how you do things, that would be amazing. Okay, yeah. So for a long form type tutorial, I'll get an idea. And I think a lot of the my personal philosophy is like, I try to make tutorials that have like really inspiring sound examples. At least I try, you know, obviously there's haters and like people aren't always going to love your work. But like, you know, you've always seen maybe a tutorial where you're like, well, that doesn't sound amazing, but they're getting the idea across. I want to make it like sound really cool and get the idea across. This is like a philosophy. And at least that makes me like sit down and work on music instead of just tutorials because I need some kind of balance, right? And I've, I've, I definitely need to have been overbalanced in that sense. By the way, for, for our audience that hasn't checked out any of Nick's uh, tutorials, whether it be through Splice or somewhere else, I'll definitely put links uh, in the episode description so you can go and check those out. And he does have really cool audio examples, uh, particularly if you tend to listen to the, the end where he'll, you know, you can skip to the end and he'll show you the final product or he's like, here's what I came up with. And it's always banging. It's really cool to listen to. I try, I try to, I always try to have, try to lead up maybe towards that. That is, thank you for noticing that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, that gives me some time. So as I say, it's like, a uh, you know, a chord progression type video, I'll then work on tracks with some cool chord progressions and I'll try to use maybe the plugins I'm supposed to use. But then I'll just like do this creation pre-production phase where I'm making the examples or maybe doing that. Sometimes I'll do it. It depends on like if it's a speed run or whatever type beginner tutorial, I'll do it all like videoing it. But like I like to do it that way so I have some cool examples and I get to work on music, not on camera and not on tutorial mode because you know as you're seeing setting up and stuff like that, it's an effort and like having lights running, it's not as natural. Um, so it's like you kind of want to be in this kind of more like non-content space to make the music in my mind. Do that a little bit, but then get into content mode. Uh, I don't really script anything out. I'll just generally do takes into Premiere. So I'll uh, get some screen recordings in, to get the camera on, and then I'll just like go straight to camera. I, I don't, I'm not a writer. Sometimes I'll script out, but definitely like if it's a uh, like a long listicle type video, I'll have the bullet points and stuff like that. Um, but then I'll do straight to camera. And the, that's the beauty of post-production magic, y'all. You can mess up, like, I'll be like, hi, my name is Mike. Hi, my name is, oh, how my name is like, uh, like, <laughs> I'll like mess up so many times at the beginning and just like cut the right one. And that's why I've gotten my like editing in Premiere and uh, Resolve, whatever, Titan, you know, I, I've streamlined that. So it's like, I know to just skip to the last one. I know, you know, that's probably the best one take or whatever. So it's like, you don't have to get a perfect. And I think that's a, a misconception a lot of people have. It's like, don't stress, like, if you don't feel like you're good at talking to camera, because I never was like comfortable talking to camera. It, it's something also you get over very quickly. Um, and then like you'll do it into a premiere. Then I like to maybe get some blender to, in like the animations for the more abstract ones. I'll do some animations with like patterns. All, all you teachers out there, like when he says blender, I guess if you're an educator looking at this, th that would be like a PowerPoint presentation for most people, I feel like. And so blender would be like the next level. <laughs> like what are you doing with blender exactly? I'm just curious. I mean, no, yeah, like, what are you using it for precisely? I, I know it's like, it's for 3D modeling is what I've seen people use it for, but how are you using it with your videos? So I did use it like for some videos for modeling, but like the videos, two videos that did pop off, you know, 500,000 views each or whatever um, for a tutorial, I think that's pretty good. What I used it for was like animating some um, abstract elements, the actual rows of cells. And I've actually seen this, you know, design copied in other tutorials, which is kind of, I guess, good. It's a good thing. Uh, but it's like rows of cells and having them animate with like light with audio. So I would like bounce out the clave rhythm just as a solo track in Ableton, put into Blender. And you can map that to any animation parameter. So you can map that to a, a, a lighting up a cell, which is like so visual for things. Um, I've also seen these cool like polyrhythms. I haven't gotten into that, but I, this is a little tangent. But I've seen these on social media, the, those polyrhythms with the shapes, like the square and maybe like a pentagon. It's like... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, yeah, I think I know. It's like bouncing a like a ball bouncing around in between or something. Blender is also just the best software, I'll say. This is like, I got into it like three years ago now at the start of the pandemic. But it's like one of my favorite softwares in the sense that it's free. It has an amazing open source community. I've spent a lot of money on plugins. So, you know, even though it's free, it's like there's still like an economy around it. 
Um, and it's just like, I don't know. There's, it's a, a unique software. There's so much love for it. And uh, yeah, so it is a cool thing to get in. As, as an educator, I could see so much value from science. Definitely, there's like, I've seen some like people breaking down waveforms with the actual like uh, light spectrum in Blender, like mathematically. And I've seen, you know, for music theory, it could be cool. But yeah, I mean, it's just like a fun 3D software. Okay, so you're using it to kind of give visual representations of abstract things that are happening in your videos. And then you said you're starting out with kind of creative content. You feel like the the musical content for those videos that are probably music-related tutorials for producers, um, you're starting out with that content first, making something creative, and then you're adding in uh, like a video layer for maybe your uh, whenever you're talking to people. And then after that, you're going in and adding in some additional visual content. Yeah. And a lot of that, like the filling in that gap is like, you know, for the creative content, once you've done that, you just like use screen recording. Screen flow is an amazing software, but it's like using that recording or QuickTime, you can do OBS. You use that software and record, you know, the key moments that you're capturing. Like, oh, this is how you space out this uh, chord, right? You need the skip four semitones, skip three semitones. So you just get those key moments on camera, drop them in Premiere, and then you can add your context, whether it be shot to camera. I, I've chosen to do like a lot of more voiceover stuff because it's easier. It's like, I don't have to set up lighting and um, camera. I know maybe it, maybe there's an argument could decrease engagement, but it's also like, it is easier. And a lot of people are there for the, the educational content. I think like it, it, the flows will be different, but a lot of people will be using that kind of screen recording flow, shot to camera and premiere, and then like, you know, um, voiceover, even like still voiceover. So yeah, and then graphics, uh, generally some After Effects. We have a great creative team that provides templates and then we'll just finish it up. And then I'll do, <laughs> I'll do the... Um, quick mix, like the mix. And then I, since I have the master everything, I just use uh, Ozone 10. I'll generally use uh, the master assistant to say that that's like the AI kind of like scans your master and like gives you suggestions just because it is useful for when you have so much volume of content. Like you can't just like, if you have to master three videos a week. You're not like, you can't send them off to a master and there's no internal like thing. So, but like, you know, using Ozone 10 on like when there's like examples where there's a lot of maybe unmastered screen flow content, from different DAWs, mm-hmm. I'll, I might need a glue like to glue them together. If it's one track at the end, like generally, I'll leave it off that. Like you know, and you can apply plugins in Premiere on individual tracks, so it's really flexible, like a DAW. Um, and you know, Pro L always just on that master track, and like you know, uh, and just do the audio, a visual cleanup. Hopefully, there's no mistakes, and I uh, then just like upload it. Their last video was like the first video I did leave an unedited section where I was like, did that little dumb stuttering where I'm like, uh, uh, like <laughs> I left it in for four seconds and then, you know, there's comments. I normally don't catch that, but it was a 30 minute tutorial and I was under a time crunch on a Friday. Uh, so I, I feel like the QC part, there's never, I don't really pass it off to anyone or anything like that. I QC it myself, uh, which could be maybe a change in the future. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can get to that point, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize, honestly, um, that, you know, you were taking care of all of this content kind of yourself in terms of mostly figuring out what the idea for the video was. And then you are creating all of the content related to that. Um, It must, I imagine that it's uh, costing you a significant amount of time. So, I mean, approximately, have you found any you know, general rule of thumb, if you start a video project, you know how long it's going to take you? Or, you know, can you share any insights about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Long form videos can definitely take a lot more time, especially if they're ambitious. And like, like I described, have an abstract element with Blender, I try to do that. Um, But yeah, generally, it'll take like, uh, one or two weeks for an idea, if I have time. But honestly, I also do a lot of other things that splice, uh, just like internally, just there's meetings always, there's other things going on. So it is hard to find, that's the hardest balance is to find that um, uh, time to focus, if you will. It's one of the hardest uh, uh, things to balance that splice uh, in my, and I would say like, you know, certain videos are easier though. Like I, my favorite video that I haven't done in a while that I might try to do is a 10 minute speed run. Cause like literally that's the easiest to edit and takes the least amount of time uh, because you just set the clock 10 minutes I, you might have to do it a few times, to be honest. Like, I, there's a few speed runs where it's like, you know, the first time I wasn't happy with it, and then you know, you do it again. 
Um, but you know, you set a timer for 10 minutes, you do the project, you do a, uh, as far as you get the edits pretty easy. Cause it's just 10 minutes. You don't have to condense it really. You just, you know, switch cameras, switch punch-ins, a little animation that those will take a week maybe to do. So those are like the, the lowest lift. And then like a uh, ambitious video that I'm going to try to do, like that includes maybe like four or five different DAWs, which is another thing I try to strive for is like, since th- my, the company I work at for Splice is in a unique position to have like different DAWs and we support different software. So it's like, those will take like maybe three or four weeks, like a month for a long form, you know, to be just kind of working uh, gradually. Cause like I'll, you need to like, I feel like I need like five or six examples uh, and then like, you know, then like edit it all. And those can be kind of intensive, but yeah, uh, short form is like a little sweeter and, you know, it does, I feel like that's, it's like, gives you quicker dopamine. And it's like, you know, I mean, the, a lot of the cha- uh, platforms are leaning into it. And even though it, it's not like one minute versus like 10 minutes is one tenth of the work, you don't, don't want to like misconceive you, but it's not as much work. Right. So it's like, you know, you still have to make a concentrated version. Like you, you could make a really hyped up short form video. Like if you look at a Mr. Beast short form video, he's like flying people to Paris to Paris to get a baguette and come back. And that's like an extreme expensive epic thing, but it's like a short, right? So it's like, you can still put a lot of resources and uh, like time and whatever into a short. Uh, but yeah, it generally it's like a uh, less work. So that's nice. Yeah. So I mean, that says a lot. Just the first thing you said is like uh, the long form videos. And by that, I take it you mean something like a, a 10 minute video. Like what are the longest videos you you think you make? Is it are they 30 minutes or 10 or what? Well, the last video I did put out was 30 minutes, but that was an Ableton Live light, like just beginner walkthrough. Um, and it's very like uh, step by step. And I'm showing the whole you know UI and trying to explain it um, at a very you know basic comprehensive level. So that is like longer. But like I'd say an average video, and this is like a hack for you want in YouTube world to have a high watch time for your uh, video to get and gain a lot of legs, right? And so it's like, if you can make a high velocity, what I call a high velocity edit, like where it's like really fast paced and high engagement, maybe you only need to make a 10 minute video that will do really well on YouTube. I feel like anything shorter is it's, it's going to be harder unless like it's a really cool, unique novel concept or like title or the CTR is like super high or whatever the click through rate. Um, but I think average for generally just average 12 to 15 minutes for our, uh, my videos. And in general, the channel may be a little bit shorter, but like, you know, the, the external contributors coming in 12, 15, 12, 15 minutes is a sweet spot, I think. Okay. Yeah. And generally you said that that uh, kind of content, that long form content that you're, you typically put out takes you about two weeks from idea all the way to finished product. Yeah, it could anywhere from two weeks to, you know, three weeks a month, depending on the scope of the video, the amount of other things going on at once. That's the thing is like, there could be a lot of campaigns I could, and, you know, needing to work on, say, three other short form videos during that time period, then it it gets a little more constraint of like, well, I can only devote this much time to this long form video. And then ultimately, I hate pushing things back. That's the one thing I hate pushing things back. It's very, having a deadline, and this goes to like, if I was like releasing more individual music, but having a calendar where you're like, that's on there and I'm not going to push it back has been ultimately, I think, super important for me to just like get things. And I think most creators would agree. Um, but then again, there's sometimes you just want to wait until it's done and you can wait until it's done. But then you know that there's a trap of it can never be like, you might not ever feel, feel like it's at a place to be done. You're like, I'm never happy with it. And you revisit and you always critique it. So there, there's those two things you have to balance, you know, and the artist, the perf- the perfection of artists or ship a lot, ship off and whatever. So I do think having a release calendar and trying not to push backs and like, no matter what, like maybe the, staying up a little later on, you know, Thursday or Friday night, whatever, towards the end of the week and like, you know, finish the edit. It's helpful just to get accountability internally for creative. Yeah, I totally agree for uh, some kind of accountability. I've typically use like friends or colleagues. Obviously, if you're working on a project with somebody, you know, there's like money on the line. Um, You're going to try to set, you know, a schedule for things that are coming up, right? And you're trying to meet those deadlines as best you can. Uh, But, uh, you know, things happen, right? Uh, Other life happens. (laughs) So it's hard to keep everything in its exact order. And it might take a little late night here or there or uh, an extra day or or whatever it turns into, but you stay as close as you can to those kind of guideposts that you set out at the beginning of the project because you 
you know, you have an idea of, and you're giving us a better idea, by the way, just in case somebody's thinking about creating video content for themselves or for them, their business or whatever, you know, they, they haven't gone through all these steps to know how much work it really takes to make the type of content that a lot of people are making these days. And now for a quick word from my sponsor, me. Are you a creative genius and entrepreneur? Well, listen up because this message is for you. Are you tired of spending countless hours struggling to find the right sound or asking your virtual assistant to come up with something else? Let me be your audio specialist extraordinaire. With refined taste and a keen focus on project management, sound design, and post-production services, I'll take your audio to the next level. Imagine having a dedicated expert by your side, ensuring that every moment with sound is perfectly balanced. From creating captivating podcasts to producing moving music, let me be your secret weapon for professional-grade results. Don't miss out on the opportunity to make your audio dreams a reality. Visit my website at ideafield.pro or drop me an email at dream at ideafield.pro to schedule a free consultation. We'll have a virtual coffee chat where we discuss your ideas, favorite styles, and maybe even your secret singing aspirations. Let's bring your audio dreams to life. Together, we'll create magic. And now, back to the episode with Nick Chen. Um, I was wondering if you could speak any to uh, how to really ensure that the content's resonating with uh, the audience that you're after. Uh, I know you said you did some research. Uh, you watch YouTube yourself, obviously. You're, look, you're paying attention to trends, but are you looking at any statistics, any you know, analytical data about things to make those decisions? Or are you doing it by feeling? It's a combination of both, yeah. So definitely the feeling aspects, like, um, you know, when watching a video, the tone, I think, is very important. I think, like, is it perspective you're talking in? Like, third person, first person? Yeah. Yes. That's important. Like, I've noticed tutorials that are like, yo, I did this and I did that and like that may not be as uh, effective as like, here, this is what you can do. Here's what you should try. Here's like, there's a weird thing where if you're talking with a person, in my mind, it's a little more engaging. Um I mean, I can do this. I can do that. Definitely, there's places for that. I don't go me wrong. It was like being conscious of tone and perspective is very important for you know the success of the content, right? We've gotten the it click through rates like the getting in the door, and this is like getting people to stay is like the engaging part. Mm-hmm. And then so that's like the kind of the feeling it out using your gut. Um, definitely a lot of competitive analysis, competitive analysis across different genres and channels. Seeing seeing what works from like. A different genre and trying to put into the more tutorialized music production space. There's a lot of satirical stuff. Unfortunately, like I don't feel like I can go that way because I'm like so attached to the Splice brand. But I've, I've actually wanted to maybe do personal, like super satirical, try to add some humor um, tutorials because you know I like comedy and stuff like that. Uh, but like that's important. So tone. The second part, the analytics section, uh, is also very important. So it's like looking at retention watch curves. And like, for example, like uh, a techniques video that had like a history portion b- before it, you can see a dip on the history portion and like a big jump up to the first technique. So like that told me like, just jump into the techniques. Most people just want to get in there. Maybe sprinkle in some history, but don't make it like a big... Now jumping into the history of things like that may be a... a, a and visibly you saw a dip. So it's like, be a little more tactful about that next time. And, you know, I tried to do that and learn from that dip in the curve. The other thing is like watch time, just the general, like that's kind of the engagement retention. Um, but like comments and, you know, people, it, there's a whole philosophy of don't read the comments. Read the, mm-hmm. I mean, I do read the comments, but it's like, I understand why you wouldn't want to. And it depends like what kind of, what, what you're going for. But like in the case where I think we are is like reading comments is helpful. You get uh, another layer of feedback on your content. And like, if some people are like, this is cool, or like we ask for specific types of videos or whatever, like that's obviously helpful. But you can generally get the sentiment and like, you know, like people going nice, uh, like being like, oh, that, that, that track in the end was really cool in the comments were like, was making like, think, oh yeah, let's put more of the cool uh, examples at the end. Maybe that'll increase the watch time. Maybe people just skip to the end, but whatever. It's like, that does inform your strategy of like engagement and the content itself. Um, and then the other thing is like uh, the edit, 
like editing style is important. And like I said, tone, and that's like the person talking, generally there's going to be a person talking. You know, there's some videos are just like, you know, text and like the examples, but like those aren't t- typically the videos we do. And, but like, for example, like TrackLib has amazing track breakdowns um, that do their short form and there's no talking. It's just the musical example and then shows the sampling technique. Those are awesome. And like, you know, that doesn't have any tone necessarily. But then it's like the visual element of the edit is super important. So then it's like, that's the engagement. And that's where you do another layer of competitive analysis. Like how often are the edit cuts? Like you don't want to be a hype edit. Like Casey Neistat, a very, you know, obviously popular vlogger was like saying he's somewhat against the hype edit or whatever. Um, And that like let the storytelling be like a little more organic. So there's there's two ways you can go and like you have to identify like is this more hype edit or is this more like organic like ASMR can type you flows? help me understand what a hype edit is exactly? Yeah, that's, that's a good call. Like hype edit, I think is like in my mind Coco Melon, uh, which is like a uh, crack for kids, but it's it, and that's not a good reference unless you have kids. Uh, obviously, <laughs> a hype edit is like going to be like anything where it's like you know like cuts every few seconds, things popping up on the screen. I feel like it is easier to keep engagement naturally because it's just tying into our human psychological of like, oh, new thing, new flashy thing like that. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I'm above hype edit and I use that technique. And I think it's like, it's important to use, know what it is and like the balance. But it's basically like having a lot of like quick, quick actions in edit versus like a slower kind of like feeling maybe. But then again, like podcasting, like listening to podcasts and long form, slow burn content is also needed. There's a balance. I feel like, uh, you know, what I've heard, I don't know, it's like, what I've heard from the kids these days, but it's like, they'll watch TikToks all the day and then they'll like wind down with a long form YouTube. Like, uh, but it's, I don't know, in the psych, in the mind, there has to be some kind of balance of like velocity or rhythm. Going back to like rhythm and like nature, it's like, we want a, a fast BPM section. We can't always be fast BPM, fast BPM. Let's slow it down a little bit. It's like, so the slow edit mm-hmm. in my mind is like, um, where like you see like an ASMR video of like just, cooking some and you hear like mm-hmm. a, but it's like engaging because it's visually stimulating it's sonically stimulating and you can do that type of thing in editorial like educational content you just have to be like that's the angle i'm going for and some of the videos i feel like i've done are more like a little slower or like and just like kind of move flow and i or like you know another form a fan of thing of like the long ed or the long shot or whatever what it's called like the what was that movie 1912 or i know i'm gonna get it wrong the world war one movie where it's all one take a one shot But like that to me is like a long form type thing where it's like all flowing. You know, it's like just from scene to scene going from one thing to thing. That sounds really tough to try to do a single uh, take or a single... uh, Yeah, single take. One shot. I I have seen those cool... Have you seen the... uh, I I forget who, who puts them out exactly, but they'll do these challenges, which which reminds me of something you said earlier uh, that I didn't know what it was, but you you said you did like this very quick production type speed video, run, like a ten minute challenge. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I said speed run. I mean, it's technically not even. I didn't even say it right. I mean, Brenda, right? <laughs> to be honest, like a speed run is technically you try to get to one hundred percent completion at any time. Um, this is a ten minute challenge, so you know it's it's reminiscent of Fact Magazine's Against the Clock. I mean, we just call it speed run um, uh, at Splice officially, but it's like this is a ten minute challenge. And it's like, you know, yeah, that definitely is helpful just because like, you're like, oh, don't second guess things, just first choice on everything. And sometimes it Mm -hmm. turns out like shite, but sometimes like (laughs) one out of, you know, 10 times it's going to be really good or like at least something that you can continue to further develop. Actually, maybe it's more than one 10. I think if you continue to do it a lot, you'll, you'll get into a flow of like, Trusting your gut more. And I think that's a really useful thing. Yeah, definitely. Trusting your gut's a, a, a very crucial thing. I think l- learning when to when to trust it and uh, when maybe to know that uh, you're going down a wrong, the wrong kind of path. I think the only way to really learn that is to actually practice what you're just talking about, like a, a speed run, like a 10-minute block. I'm going to do start to finish in this amount of time, make decisions very quickly. You do that enough times, you'll start to probably identify what's going to work and what's not so you can you can switch away from it more quickly and rather than spinning your wheels for hours on a, a YouTube video that will may end up flopping, you know. Exactly. Uh, I, I guess what a, a long, long way around to what I was trying to say earlier, but uh, I remember watching these videos about artists. They would uh, They would challenge them to create like a piece of music with 
within a certain amount of time. I can't remember if, if it was also 10 minutes or if it was as long as 30 minutes, but they were basically supposed to go from blank slate, nothing in the, you know, recorded to finished track. And then they would show them all through the process of them making that track and then play the track, of course, for you at the very end. And uh, have you ever seen that or have you ever tried that? Yeah, definitely that. I mean, 30 minutes is a nicer parameter and you could probably actually get a nicer composition. Uh, I've done 10 minutes. I've done five minutes. But like 10 minutes, five minutes, you get like the, like generally you'll get like an A, B, an A idea, an A, B idea. You'd be hard pressed to get a a true like nice intro, outro, you know, extra section, uh, bridge or whatever, like. I definitely was inspired by that to to do that type of content on 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 the channels I do. But it's like, yeah, uh, I think that's epic. I think everyone should try it. Yeah, definitely try it. If you haven't tried it, uh, anybody out there, uh, give yourself a real short time. Where's the timer? Where's the clock app? I mean, it's like everyone has this. <laughs> like, just set it. Set a time. Actually, start with twenty minutes, maybe the first time. So it's less or thirty minutes is actually nice. Thirty minutes, I feel like I could start to get into more of like the ten minutes is like. That's really fast. And you're like, you're just like going. Um, so I don't know. Actually, I'm going to try 30 minutes. I think it depends on the project, you know, what what people are looking to accomplish. I Very would say true. for most people that don't have much experience making a YouTube video, a 30 minutes would be like a nightmare probably. <laughs> no, no, for, for sure. No, 30 minutes can feel like 10 minutes very quickly if you're trying to make a drop, like a really hyper level of detail. But like level of detail is the thing I was thinking about in music production. Like it, level of detail is a thing in video games and like 3D. And it's just like, how many parameters are you going to go in and change? Like, I feel like certain types of EDM and like bass music has a lot of level of detail, right? In the sound design and like a uh, really popping off, you know, hip hop song doesn't necessarily have to have the level of detail, but then it has, just has to have the other things like, which is like, you know, the, the soul, the, the vibe, the mix, the, uh, you know, like the actual, like just the sonic, like, you know, there's a lot of other things other than level of detail, like the harmonics and whatnot. But like, it's an interesting thing in music production, electronic music. I think level of detail is an interest. Yeah, I feel like, This is kind of a good segue into talking about one of the newer things that Splice has released recently. And I noticed you, your voice at least, on uh, one of the videos that they have up right now. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the AI uh, new feature in Splice to help people kind of start getting their ideas. And of course, this is super popular right now. It's a buzzword. Uh, Everybody seems to be you throwing around AI, even though maybe it's not AI. I've seen it at Panasonic talking about an AI shaver or something recently. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I watched your video about Splice's new Create feature. And it was, it was really inspiring, actually. I, it made me want to use it to make the intro to this podcast. Like seriously, I haven't I haven't even sat down to try to do that yet, but whenever I watch the video and just watch you like go through and say, "Well, let's roll the dice again and go to the next variation and then watch you go through each one." I was I was very inspired. I'm like, "Yeah, you could make so much uh content just from this tool by itself." Well, yeah, so first off, it is AI. It is true AI, and I have to say that because our product engineer uh, or LA will come and hunt me down like uh, Taken or whatever. Um, but and you know, it's it's AI w- which is like powered by humans, which is awesome because like it's all from our library. We've worked really hard, over, you know, to make over the past is almost now almost ten years. We're coming out in ten years, right? Uh, you know, all these very talented musicians from all these labels. I made these samples and then the AI is kind of like kind of matching them in a sense. It's not like AI is generating the sound. So I think that's dope because, you know, there's an ethical thing like to the whole AI thing. And like I saw you saw the art, the visual art community, you know, get, uh, you know, pretty outraged by Mid Journey, Dolly, whatever, all these stable diffusion, all these things coming out. And rightfully so. It's like it's an interesting time where we're like I, I look at it as like it's a turnover. Like it's the the gap between tape and digital, um, you know, like the people who were like, just like, no, I'm never going to digital tapes. Like, but even more so, you know, cause now we're like further along the exponential curve. Um, for create though, what's amazing is that, like you said, it's like, it's not, I mean, it's not, you're not going to, some people might put a whole stack and like, this is my song and be like, that's it. But most mm-hmm. people are going to use it as it's intended and not intended to, but it's as a tool you can use it intended. But I think most people are going to use it the way, you know, I feel like I'm going to use it, which is like trying to start an idea or use it to like make a 
what I think I'm trying to do is like make more unique resamples because in my mind, it's like the odds of someone, the next producer next door going to the splice page and finding a, a, a loop and me finding the same loop. I mean, it's not, it's like mid odds, whatever. Let's say it's like, well, I don't know. I'm not going to name an odds, but it's like, then the, the odds of a, a producer generating the same stack was very low. And then combining a few of those samples into what I call resampling, which is like, you know, or like not I call this like resampling uh, is the technique of like just combining some sounds and now it's a new sample. Um, and like that, then like the odds of a producer combining those three sounds right off the bat and using that as a singular sample is like less, way less. And I think that's actually a good thing. Like we'll all have a, a be able to f- like fly off into space at, at different vectors and, and have different starting creation points that are even further out because of the power of AI, like the velocity AI at, um, but you know, I'm glad that you kind of saw the inspiration. I love the rolling the dice thing because like the other thing I've recently gotten into is like, it's a little gaming thing going back to video games. So I'm a huge gamer. Uh, but like the loot box mentality is very dangerous. Like, what's in that box? Is there anything in there? Like, like even if you're like you're fully yeah. committed, like you're gonna go loot it or whatever. It's like there could be something cool in there. Um, I've found that that same type of like psychological effect in my mind. Like when I hit the new stack button, I'm like, this stack's pretty awesome. Like I definitely could start an idea. But what if the next? Like what about the next one? Uh, so it's like that is an interesting also phenomenon. I don't. I think that will be good. I don't know. That could be again one of those things working against Perilous by choice, but hopefully it doesn't. I could see it like a like a, a three roll option. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. Like that's just one thing I want to call out that I've found that unexpectedly. Um, you know, as far as the uh, tools, there's actually really that's just the beginning. I mean, there's going to be some exciting things coming down the line very very soon. Yeah, it, I'm glad that you you know saw that. But you know, I'm I'm also you know aware that a lot of people are anti AI just across the board. Um, I am aware that I'm a technologist at heart and like I'm an early adopter at heart. Like I'll just be like, oh, look at this thing. It's so cool. Everyone's going to be using it. And then like mm-hmm. really no one starts using it. I'm like, okay, well, you know, now, but you know, eventually maybe they will. Uh, so I do acknowledge that. But yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. How you foresee like AI in the uh, art community in general? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, me personally, I think uh, I'm not anti AI and I'm probably I'm probably lean toward this like technologist kind of standpoint where I believe that it can it can help us uh, in many ways. And I like that it can like you were voicing before, it can get you started in one direction. Um, the my favorite tools, I guess, that I've that I've seen recently allow you to kind of break apart the the things that the AI has given you to into different elements so that it kind of it allows you to tweak the parameters after you've been giving given the results. Uh, I kind of steer away from the the tools that are kind of set and forget. You can't tweak anything. You can't see what it's done. It, then it's a it's almost like it's a guarded secret. You know what I mean? Like you like that transparency and control. Transparency yeah. and control is important. Yeah, I, I I don't like that. That turns me off. Um, if the tool is is like that, so I do like that. You know, particularly with Splice's tool, you know, you can see those samples. You, I'm sure you can go back and. Maybe you can even find out uh, who originally made those. I don't know. If oh you yeah, can I mean, not. you just click into the pack, and it, it, it's the pack uh, description or whatnot. Um, and then the other thing I want that is like it is meant to be controlled in the DAW. Like I feel like it's more controls, but I do see what you're saying. Like I think that's epic. I've seen some awesome like stem splitting tools and and tools where like it basically feels like you're getting more control into a uh, object or asset or device that would otherwise be like what you're saying, like static. And that's a powerful feeling and that's dope. Um, and I feel like, yes, yeah, stuff like that's coming. But it's like uh, another one I think that I saw Synth Plant 2 is so sick. That was like amazing demo. And uh, you should definitely check that out. Um, it's basically you can like grow a sound off of any sound and just kind of makes a variation quickly just using like insane AI and machine learning and whatever. Uh, so it's a synthesizer? So it's a synthesizer, yeah. Definitely check it out. It's mm. pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally feel you on that. And like, obviously, I've learned a lot of the... the the I feel like the people who are divided, like the people who have spent the 10,000 so, quote, hours uh, learning all the steps and the processes and the workflows that now are almost negated 
because of these amazing AI tools that are like, so it's like, there's an interesting, like, I wouldn't say bitterness, but it's like, yeah, I'm not going to necessarily need that. Or I've like, I've already learned the control where I'm like looking at like the 12 year old who's coming up, are they going to really care? And I just think there's an interesting, like we're at an interesting, um, like transition or like a gener- generation phase or whatever. But yeah, I, I totally feel you. Like when I, on the visual stuff, like I, I, I sent, I like the more like going in uh, like or the Photoshop, like in painting, like the generative feels really cool. You can get in just like sort of like th- th- those aspects of like having a control versus just like text to image feels like a little more control. And I think the perception of control, even though it might be just a perception, is like going to be very important. Yeah. I, yeah. So my one of my uh, friends that uh, is actually here in Taiwan and uh, I collaborate with her every once in a while, she's you know, telling me about all the new AI technology that uh, the algorithms that Adobe has been releasing recently in all of their tools so that you can start using, you know, for Illustrator and After Effects, you know, they're starting to incorporate this into the workflow to basically cut down on the amount of time as, of course, you know, it's an incredible amount of time that it takes to generate you know, video content, edit, uh, X, I've even just, I mean, exporting, my God, <laughs> I wish exactly. AI could just solve that. But uh, I guess that's yeah. a, a different restriction. Yeah, that is actually what I wanted the AI to do the most. Though, is like the tedious tasks. Like in my mind, the, the best the AI I'm going to be most excited for is the one that's like, if I hit record on a camera and a screen flow or everything, it's automatically all assets are in the video editor, like lined up and like ready to go. That's the AI I'm like going to be super hyped for because yeah, let's take away the tedious, the most tedious tasks first versus like some of the most creative, rewarding ones. That is the other things like you know that that we should think about like you know what do humans love, what do humans hate. Let's try to like remove some of those first, if you will. I'd love that too. Uh, there's a lot of just logistical things that uh, everybody has to do, and uh, if I can get that virtual assistant in here to help me with those. Uh, little things, I would definitely shell out some money for it. Uh, <laughs> exactly, that's the, the paid thing. That, I mean, I, yeah, exactly. I'm well, uh, Nick, I don't. I know that you've. We've been talking here for a while. We talked about uh, quite a number of things, all the way from you know some of your your projects, uh, creating videos for Splice, educational content, uh, some of your workflow that uh, you use while you're making each one of these projects, and how much time. Um, it costs you and some of the tools that you use to do all these things. Um, we didn't quite get to uh, any tools you might use whenever you're collaborating with people um, online. I know that you are working uh, remotely uh, exclusively, correct? Yeah, yeah. So Splice is remote. Splice Studio, which was our remote collaboration, did shut down. But that's because the company is focusing on which is much needed focus on, you know, our core competencies, which is like sounds um, and, and, you know, the sound. So, you know, when we collaborate and like in general, it's like Zoom and, you know, Dropbox, Drive, those types of services. I, I'm a huge Dropbox, like been using Dropbox for 10 years um, fan. So it's like I was almost calculating how much I'm going to pay them over my lifetime and was like disgusted a little bit. But, uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> I'll always want my photos and my data. And I'm like, well, how much will that cost in 70 years? Fuck. Uh, that's what I was like. Uh, but, you know, it is the value of because I have so many machines and whatever, you know, work on different devices and it's like that kind of cloud computing. But yeah, um, other than that, like remote collaboration. I mean, Zoom's great for even producing or video editing we've done. There are some new tools popping up like like multiplayer type DAWs and stuff like that, sound tr- like web based DAWs that are, have like multiple inputs that are very intriguing, but I just haven't gotten a chance to try them out. Finding collaborators is also hard. I think there may be a, a need to be a solution for that, like, or like, you know, getting people to collaborate because you're working on very similar interests and things. Maybe AI could help with that. Pairing people up with collaborators. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, you've been grinding on these Blender, like, uh, Ableton type videos that are like, very niche, but guess what? There's a few other people that are actually doing this. Like, uh, maybe you should collaborate with them and like sets out this kind of like joint project. I don't know. It could be interesting. And maybe there's a, maybe there's an actual gig attached to it. That'd be so interesting. If it was like a monetary, like, Hey, this is a thousand dollar contract for you three to co- collaborate on. And you accept it. Cause you're like, yeah, I want the thousand dollars, but then you also gain collaborators. And then like, there's a work of done that the AI is already kind of lined up for delivery because of this asset that it, it's kind of vetted. That could be mm-hmm. kind of sick. But yeah, I feel like uh, just co- collaborations 
an interesting one in the very digital world that I'm living in. And like, you know, I, I, I get that not a lot of people live in this super digital world, but I think we are trending that way as a society, obviously. Yeah, I think the, uh, it's a cool idea, by the way. I mean, just like having AI try to pair people um, up inside of a community that you you already have. And uh, of course, Splice does have a wonderful community. Um, I am in part of the Discord server, so I see all the stuff that's going on in there. Um, Hell yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I guess another thing I was going to ask you about is like, you know, just, just communication. Uh, I'm sure you have to communicate internally. And I know you said you haven't quite, um, you haven't had many projects recently that you've uh, collaborated online with, but you know, you deliver things through Dropbox is what you said, and then have meetings or some kind of collaborations through Zoom. Are there any other tools that you use uh, on a consistent basis? Like, uh, I mean, are you still using the email, using like Discord, Slack? What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Slack, um, definitely uh, Airtable is our like project management software the marketing team uses, which is very, you know, very robust and, and you know, um, a, a deep soft, like, so not so, well. I guess it's software, obviously, but like deep, uh, um, powerful. And then also, uh, Figma is one we use for like sketching out ideas, brainstorming as a, a remote team. Those are the main ones. I mean, you know, other teams will obviously use different softwares, but you know, oh, Frame.io is what we use for like video editing feedback. Um, you know, for comment internal commenting and stuff like that. But yeah, so it's 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 pretty. I think a, a standard set of corporate software at, at this point, but uh, I will say like uh, Airtable is, is actually sick. And like, if I did think about, I thought about like doing like, you know, tutorials on my own channel or whatever, like I do feel like going back to that calendar, going back to like being organized and having these like deadlines on a date that you're like, I'm not going to try to move that and visualize like this weekend, this is due. And like, I feel like I would do re-implement that on a personal note, like on a personal level, because like that has been successful. I have learned that's been successful and, you know, maybe would be for you listening. Nice. So uh, that, again, that tool was called... Oh, Notion uh, as well. Notion's awesome. I forgot Notion. And a lot of people okay, use Notion. Yeah. You can use Notion for that too, like as a calendar type, you know, setup and like delivery system. But yeah, people love Notion. That'd been right, right, right. So it's basically giving you like this, uh, a, either a calendar view or kind of a board view, con- a Kanban yeah. style thing where it's... Yeah, like Kanban moving. is another one that the engineers use. Yeah. You use Kanban? Uh, I mean, it, I just know it as a style of, you know, like laying out different pieces oh, is of that a just project. A re- reference of the style Kanban is that is not a. That's what that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, it, you, it is. It's. I thought it was a. I mean, the company obviously just named its company off the style, which is, makes sense because then it's like very obvious. But I didn't even realize that that was that. I well, I'm that gonna connect. have to go and check that out for sure before I just <laughs> uh, put that out into the ether. <laughs> All right, let's get the let's get the fact checkers on this podcast, and now 80 percent has been edited right. out, and we only have 20 percent of truth left. All right, well, uh, so you know, last little thing here is, uh, do you have any advice for people that you know want to start creating content or just starting out, possibly? And what are some key things and principles, strategies that you think they should pay attention to? Well, I kind of, I think the first one I did say is like learning to learn and learning is important. So like, I'll just go off those two. It's like, if you don't find yourself like trying to learn new things or, or not like, or struggle to do that, um, I feel like that, that it's, it's going to be hard to prescribe like a singular strategy for everyone listening because there's so many types of learners or whatever. But I feel like getting involved in a community, getting some people on YouTube you like following and just like get used to seeing their faces or whatever that like, Kind of gives you a drawback to the the passion or the uh, pursuit you're trying to go after is very important. Um, now, other than that, there's a grind that you will come to, and avoiding burnouts is another important thing that we didn't really talk about. But it's like if you're going to start getting into this and like content creation, I'm sure even like if you're not doing it for a profession or like you're doing, you might even be burning out or doing this on your own social media accounts or whatever. Um, but it's like of uh, strategies to avoid burnout is like you know you got to find a balance. You got to find something that's like like uh, yin yang, I think, to whatever you're a hundred percent pursuing. Like, unfortunately, like, like mine, like music production, video games, like those two are like too close to on the computer. They're too digital. So like, I've been starting to get mm-hmm. more into outdoor stuff, biking, you know, like analog di- IRL world, like life. But it's like finding a balance uh, is it's a marathon, right? Life's a marathon, and you can sprint for a, a you know that first lap, and then you might get an injury or you might burn out. And it's like ultimately. Uh, that's a very important one 
But I think like there's also a lot of information online to avoid and strategies to do that. But me personally, it was about finding like a yin yang type balance of something that's just like clearly not like on a computer or like oh, going back to like physical instruments, like which is it's kind of embarrassing to say that's like my yin yang, like going back to play physical instruments. But it's like, you know, as a digital first now, I feel like I'm so digital first, like getting on and closing my eyes, playing piano, closing my eyes, playing guitar. So it's just like listening, ears, physical, something like something different, you know, disconnect, whatever. Um, and then another one is like, don't be afraid to like, you know, fake it until you make it a little bit. So like that goes into learning. If you're confident you can learn fast and you're like, have the strategies to learn, then like faking it until you make it is a little less intimidating and less of a, a incline because you may be able to get to the make it faster. Versus like you're still faking it, faking it, faking it until you make it, right? So it's like, I, I feel like there's a curve. There's a, uh, like talking about Bezier curves and curves, like, there is something to that. It's like, don't be afraid to do that if you feel confident in your learning abilities and like try to make those two work in conjunction with each other. Like get your, like feel like you're a fast learner and whatever, you know, if you're not passionate about learning, like try to, again, like get in those communities or find something you are passionate about. And then if you see opportunities, don't be afraid to go after them. It's, it's easy to say that though, because like it's easy to say that and preach that because like, you know, failure is also like, always a thing that everyone's worried about and you know that but you always have to just look at failure as learning and whatnot and that's like so tried and true and and whatnot but it's like the more you can just try to embody that um it's it's again it's like almost you're saying it and your like heart's feeling differently like there might be Mm -hmm. like shame or whatnot and failing and your brain's like no it's okay but it's like just try to embody that and that's going to help out if you're just starting out in this getting out of college or whatever or getting out of school world at the bubble and getting into, say, the uh, the real world, as, as we called it at the beginning. Um, so yeah, that's it. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time again uh, to come and talk with me on the other side of the world here, me and the typhoon and you in the heat. And uh, it's been a pleasure. I hope uh, we can do it again, maybe meet up over there in Texas one of these days very soon. And I wish you the best at Splice and, uh, and all your other endeavors. I appreciate you, Craig. And you have a great one, man. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, there's a lot to take in from this episode. And Blender keeps coming up on my radar, so I think it's definitely something I have to download and just check out for myself. Not sure how I'm going to use it yet, though. And also, don't forget, we got our action items. So the action items that I came up with for this episode are, number one, Embrace AI as a tool for creativity. Explore AI-powered tools and platforms that can enhance our creative process. Experiment with resampling and generating new ideas using AI algorithms. Number two, utilize post-production editing. Don't stress about getting content perfect in one take. Leverage video editing software like Premiere and Blender to refine your work cut out mistakes, and enhance the overall quality of your projects. And number three, experiment with different creative approaches. Explore different editing styles and visual elements in order to create engaging content. Find a balance between fast-paced editing for hype and slower, long-form content like podcasts to accommodate different viewer preferences. Again, that was Experiment with AI-powered tools to expand your creative process, utilize editing software to relieve stress and enhance your projects, and lastly, try varying your approach to expand your audience. Remember, learning is an ongoing journey and finding a balance between pursuing passions and taking breaks is key. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Field Talk. Please share this episode with someone you know to spread the love and show your support. And don't forget to subscribe and join me for future episodes where I dive deeper into the world of creativity and inspiration. Till next time, stay creative.